Chapter 9 of Humorous Ghost Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rene Lacroix. Humorous Ghost Stories, selected by Dorothy Scarborough. Chapter 9. Did the ghost leave Scotland for America as soon as the old baron died? asked Baby Van Rensselaer, with much interest. How did he come over? queried dear Jones, in the steerage or as a cabin passenger? I don't know, answered Uncle Larry, calmly, and Eliphalat didn't know, for as he was in no danger and stood in no need of warning, he couldn't tell whether the ghost was on duty or not. Of course he was on the watch for it all the time, but he never got any proof of its presence until he went down to the little old house of Salem just before the 4th of July. He took a friend down with him, a young fellow who had been in the regular army since the day Ford Sumter was fired on, and who thought that after four years of the little unpleasantness down south, including six months in Libby, and after ten years of fighting the bad Indians on the plains, he wasn't likely to be much frightened by a ghost. Well, Eliphalet and the officer sat out on the porch all the evening smoking and talking over points in military law. A little after twelve o'clock, just as they began to think it was about time to turn in, they heard the most ghastly noise in the house. It wasn't a shriek, or a howl, or a yell, or anything they could put a name to. It was an undeterminate, inexplicable shiver and shudder of sound which went wailing out of the window. The officer had been at Cold Harbor, but he felt himself getting colder this time. Eliphalet knew it was the ghost who haunted the house. As this weird sound died away, it was followed by another sharp, short, blood-curdling in its intensity. Something in this cry seemed familiar to Eliphalet and he felt sure that it proceeded from the family ghost, the warning wraith of the Duncans. "'Do I understand you to intimate that both ghosts were there together?' inquired the Duchess, anxiously. "'Both of them were there,' answered Uncle Larry. "'You see, one of them belonged to the house, and had to be there all the time, and the other was attached to the person of Baron Duncan, and had to follow him there.' Wherever he was, there was that ghost also. But Eliphalet, he had scarcely time to think this over when he heard both sounds again, not one after another, but both together, and something told him, some sort of an instinct he had, that those two ghosts didn't agree, didn't get on together, didn't exactly hit it off, in fact, that they were quarreling. Quarreling ghost? Well, I never, was Baby Van Rensselaer's remark. It is a blessed thing to see ghosts dwell together in unity, said dear Jones, and the Duchess added, It would certainly be setting a better example. You know, resumed Uncle Larry, that two waves of light or of sound may interfere and produce darkness or silence. So it was with these rival spooks. They interfered, but they did not produce silence or darkness. On the contrary, as soon as Eliphalet and the officer went into the house, there began at once a series of spiritualistic manifestations, a regular dark seance. A tambourine was played upon, a bell was rung, and a flaming banjo went singing around the room. Where did they get the banjo? asked dear Jones, skeptically. I don't know. Materialized it, maybe, just as they did the tambourine. You don't suppose a quiet New York lawyer kept a stock of musical instruments large enough to fit out a strolling minstrel troupe just on the chance of a pair of ghosts coming to give him a surprise party, do you? Every spook has its own instrument of torture. Angels play on harps, I'm informed, and spirits delight in banjos and tambourines. These spooks of Eliphalet Duncans were ghosts with all modern improvements, and I guess they were capable of providing their own musical weapons. At all events, they had them there in the little old house at Salem the night Eliphalet and his friend came down, and they played on them, and they rang the bell, and they rapped here, there, and everywhere, and they kept it up all night. All night? asked the awe-stricken Duchess. All night long, 
said Uncle Larry, solemnly, and the next night, too. Eliphalad did not get a wink of sleep, neither did his friend. On the second night the house ghost was seen by the officer. On the third night it showed itself again, and the next morning the officer packed his gripsack and took the first train to Boston. He was a New Yorker, but he said he'd sooner go to Boston than see that ghost again. Eliphalat wasn't scared at all, partly because he never saw either the domiciliary or the titular spook, and partly because he felt himself on friendly terms with the spirit world, and didn't scare easily. But after losing three nights' sleep and the society of his friend, he began to be a little impatient, and to think that the thing had gone far enough. You see, while in a way he was fond of ghosts, yet he liked them best one at a time. Two ghosts were one too many. He wasn't bent on making a collection of spooks. He and one ghost were company, but he and two ghosts were a crowd. What did he do? asked Baby Van Rensselaer. Well, he couldn't do anything. He waited a while, hoping they would get tired, but he got tired out first. You see, it comes natural to a spook to sleep in the daytime, but a man wants to sleep nights, and they wouldn't let him sleep nights. They kept on wrangling and quarreling incessantly. They manifested, and they dark seance as regularly as the old clock on the stairs struck twelve. They rapped, and they rang bells, and they banged the tambourine, and they threw the flaming banjo about the house, and worse than all, they swore. I did not know that spirits were addicted to bad language, said the Duchess. How did he know they were swearing? Could he hear them? asked dear Jones. That was just it, responded Uncle Larry. He could not hear them, at least not distinctly. There were inarticulate murmurs and stifled rumblings, but the impression produced on him was that they were swearing. If they had only sworn right out, he would not have minded it so much because he would have known the worst, but the feeling that the air was full of suppressed profanity was very wearing, and after standing it for a week he gave up in disgust and went to the White Mountains. Leaving them to fight it out, I suppose, interjected Baby Van Rensselaer. Not at all exclaimed Uncle Larry. They could not quarrel unless he was present. You see, he could not leave the titular ghost behind him, and the domiciliary ghost could not leave the house. When he went away, he took the family ghost with him, leaving the house ghost behind. Now spooks can't quarrel when they are a hundred miles apart any more than men can. And what happened afterwards? asked Baby Van Rensselaer, with a pretty impatience. A most marvelous thing happened. Eliphalet Duncan went to the White Mountains, and in the car of the railroad that runs to the top of Mount Washington he met a classmate whom he had not seen for years, and this classmate introduced Duncan to his sister, and this sister was a remarkably pretty girl, and Duncan fell in love with her at first sight, and by the time he got to the top of Mount Washington he was so deep in love that he began to consider his own unworthiness, and to wonder whether she might ever be induced to care for him a little, ever so little. I don't think that is so marvelous a thing, said dear Jones, glancing at baby Van Rensselaer. Who was she? asked the Duchess, who had once lived in Philadelphia. She was Miss Kitty Sutton of San Francisco, and she was the daughter of old Judge Sutton, of the firm of Pixley and Sutton. A very respectable family, assented the Duchess. I hope she wasn't a daughter of that loud and vulgar old Mrs. Sutton whom I met at Saratoga one summer four or five years ago, said dear Jones. Probably she was, Uncle Larry responded. She was a horrid old woman. The boys used to call her Mother Gorgon. The pretty Kitty Sutton with whom Eliphalet Duncan had fallen in love was the daughter of Mother Gorgon, but he never saw the mother, who was in Frisco, or Los Angeles, or Santa Fe, or somewhere out west, and he saw a great deal of the daughter, who was up in the White Mountains. She was traveling with her brother and his wife, and as they journeyed from hotel to hotel, Duncan went with them, and filled out the quartet. Before the end of the summer, he began to think about proposing. Of course, he had lots of chances, going on excursions, as they were every day. He made up his mind to seize the first opportunity, and that very evening he took her out for a moonlight row on Lake Winnipesaukee. As he handed her into the boat, he resolved to do it, and he had a glimmer of suspicion that she knew he was going to do it, too. "'Girls,' said dear Jones, "'never go out in a rowboat at night with a young man unless you mean to accept him.' 
sometimes it's best to refuse him and get it over once for all said baby van rensselaer impersonally as eliphalet took the oars he felt a sudden chill he tried to shake it off but in vain he began to have a growing consciousness of impending evil before he had taken ten strokes and he was a swift oarsman he was aware of a mysterious presence between him and miss sutton was it the guardian angel ghost warning him off the match interrupted dear jones that's just what it was said uncle larry and he yielded to it and kept his peace and rowed miss sutton back to the hotel with his proposal unspoken more fool he said dear jones it will take more than one ghost to keep me from proposing when my mind is made up and he looked at baby van rensselaer the next morning continued uncle larry eliphalet overslept himself and when he went down to a late breakfast he found that the suttons had gone to new york by the morning train he wanted to follow them at once and again he felt the mysterious presence overpowering his will he struggled two days and at last he roused himself to do what he wanted in spite of the spook when he arrived in new york it was late in the evening he dressed himself hastily and went to the hotel where the suttons were in the hope of seeing at least her brother the guardian angel fought every inch of the walk with him until he began to wonder whether if miss sutton were to take him the spook would forbid the bands at the hotel he saw no one that night and he went home determined to call as early as he could the next afternoon and make an end of it when he left his office about two o'clock the next day to learn his fate he had not walked five blocks before he discovered that the wraith of the duncans had withdrawn his opposition to the suit there was no feeling of impending evil no resistance no struggle no consciousness of an opposing presence eliphalet was greatly encouraged he walked briskly to the hotel he found miss sutton alone he asked her the question and got his answer said baby van rensselaer of course said uncle larry and while they were in the first flush of joy swapping confidences and confessions her brother came into the parlor with an expression of pain on his face and a telegram in his hand the former was caused by the latter which was from frisco and which announced the sudden death of mrs sutton their mother and that was why the ghost no longer opposed the match questioned dear jones exactly you see the family ghost knew that mother gorgon was an awful obstacle to duncan's happiness so it warned him but the moment the obstacle was removed it gave its consent at once the fog was lowering its thick damp curtain and it was beginning to be difficult to see from one end of the boat to the other dear jones tightened the rug which enwrapped baby van rensselaer and then withdrew again into his own substantial coverings uncle larry paused in his story long enough to light another of the tiny cigars he always smoked i infer that lord duncan the duchess was scrupulous in the bestowal of titles saw no more of the ghost after he was married he never saw them at all at any time either before or since but they came very near breaking off the match and thus breaking two young hearts you don't mean to say that they knew any just cause or impediment why they should not forever after hold their peace asked dear jones how could a ghost or even two ghosts keep a girl from marrying the man she loved this was baby van rensselaer's question it seems curious doesn't it and uncle larry tried to warm himself by two or three sharp pulls at his fiery little cigar and the circumstances are quite as curious as the fact itself you see miss sutton wouldn't be married for a year after her mother's death so she and duncan had lots of time to tell each other all they knew eliphalet got to know a good deal about the girl she went to school with and kitty sue learned all about his family he didn't tell her about the title for a long time as he wasn't one to brag but he described to her the little old house at salem and one evening towards the end of the summer the wedding day having been appointed for early in september she told him that she didn't want a bridal tour at all she just wanted to go down to the little old house at salem to spend her honeymoon in peace and quiet with nothing to do and nobody to bother them well eliphalet jumped at the suggestion 
it suited him down to the ground all of a sudden he remembered the spooks it had knocked him all of a heap he had told her about the duncan banshee and the idea of having an ancestral ghost in personal attendance on her husband tickled her immensely but he had never said anything about the ghost which haunted the little old house at salem he knew she would be frightened out of her wits if the house ghost revealed itself to her and he saw at once that it would be impossible to go to salem on their wedding trip so he told her all about it and how whenever he went to salem the two ghosts interfered and gave dark seances and manifested and materialized and made the place absolutely impossible kitty listened in silence and eliphalet thought she had changed her mind but she hadn't done anything of the kind just like a man to think she was going to remarked baby van rensselaer she just told him she could not bear a ghost herself but she would not marry a man who was afraid of them just like a girl to be so inconsistent remarked dear jones uncle larry's tiny cigar had long been extinct he lighted a new one and continued ella Vallette protested in vain kitty said her mind was made up she was determined to pass her honeymoon in the little old house at salem and she was equally determined not to go there as long as there were any ghosts there until he could assure her that the spectral tenant had received notice to quit and that there was no danger of manifestations and materializing she refused to be married at all she did not intend to have her honeymoon interrupted by two wrangling ghosts and the wedding could be postponed until he had made ready the house for her she was an unreasonable young woman said the duchess well that's what eliphalet thought much as he was in love with her and he believed he could talk her out of her determination but he couldn't she was set and when a girl is set there's nothing to do but to yield to the inevitable and that's just what eliphalet did he saw he would either have to give her up or to get the ghost out and as he loved her and he did not care for the ghost he resolved to tackle the ghost he had clear grit eliphalet had he was half scotch and half yankee and neither breed turns tail in a hurry so he made his plans and he went down to salem as he said good-bye to kitty he had an impression that she was sorry she had made him go but she kept up bravely and put a bold face on it and saw him off and went home and cried for an hour and was perfectly miserable until he came back the next day did he succeed in driving the ghost away asked baby van rensselaer with great interest that's just what i'm coming to said uncle larry pausing at the critical moment in the manner of the trained story-teller you see eliphalet had got a rather tough job and he would gladly have had an extension of time on the contract but he had to choose between the girl and the ghost and he wanted the girl he tried to invent or remember some short and easy way with ghosts but he couldn't he wished that somebody had invented a specific for spooks something that would make the ghost come out of the house and die in the yard he wondered if he could not tempt the ghost to run in debt so that he might get the sheriff to help him he wondered also whether the ghost could not be overcome with strong drink a dissipated spook a spook with delirium tremens might be committed to the inebriate asylum but none of these things seemed feasible what did he do interrupted dear jones the learned consul will please speak to the point you will regret this unseemly haste said uncle larry gravely when you know what really happened what was it uncle larry asked baby van rensselaer i'm all impatience and uncle larry proceeded ella Follette went down to the little old house at salem and as soon as the clock struck twelve the rival ghost began wrangling as before raps here there and everywhere ringing bells banging tambourines strumming banjos sailing about the room and all the other manifestations and materializations followed one another just as they had the summer before the only difference eliphalet could detect was a stronger flavor in the spectral profanity and this of course was only a vague impression for he did not actually hear a single word he waited a while in patience listening and watching of course he never saw either of the ghosts because neither of them could appear to him at last he got his dander up 
and he thought it was about time to interfere, so he rapped on the table and asked for silence. As soon as he felt that the spooks were listening to him, he explained the situation to them. He told them he was in love, and that he could not marry unless they vacated the house. He appealed to them as old friends, and he laid claim to their gratitude. The titular ghost had been sheltered by the Duncan family for hundreds of years, and the domiciliary ghost had had free lodging in their little old house at Salem for nearly two centuries. He implored them to settle their differences and to get him out of his difficulty at once. He suggested that they had better fight it out then and there and see who was the master. He had brought down with him all needful weapons, and he pulled out his valise and spread on the table a pair of navy revolvers, a pair of shotguns, a pair of dueling swords, and a couple of bowie knives. He offered to serve as second for both parties and to give the word when to begin. He also took out of his valise a pack of cards and a bottle of poison, telling them that if they wished to avoid carnage they might cut the cards to see which one should take the poison. Then he waited anxiously for the reply. For a little space there was silence. Then he became conscious of a tremulous shivering in one corner of the room and he remembered that he had heard from the direction what sounded like a frightened sigh when he made the first suggestion of the duel. Something told him that this was the domiciliary ghost and that it was badly scared. Then he was impressed by a certain movement in the opposite corner of the room as though the titular ghost were drawing himself up with offended dignity. Eliphalet couldn't exactly see those things because he never saw the ghost, but he felt them. After a silence of nearly a minute, a voice came from the corner where the family ghost stood, a voice strong and full, but trembling slightly with suppressed passion, and this voice told Eliphalet it was plain enough that he had not long been the head of the Duncans, and that he had never properly considered the characteristics of his race if now he supposed that one of his blood could draw his sword against a woman. Eliphalet said he had never suggested that the Duncan ghost should raise his hand against a woman, and all he wanted was that the Duncan ghost should fight the other ghost, and then the voice told Eliphalet that the other ghost was a woman. What? said dear Jones, sitting up suddenly. You don't mean to tell me that the ghost which haunted the house was a woman? Those were the very words Eliphalet Duncan used, said Uncle Larry, but he did not need to wait for the answer. All at once he recalled the traditions about the domiciliary ghost, and he knew that what the titular ghost said was the fact. He had never thought of the sex of a spook, but there was no doubt whatever that the house ghost was a woman. No sooner was this firmly fixed in Eliphalet's mind than he saw his way out of the difficulty. The ghost must be married, for then there would be no interference, no more quarreling, no more manifestations and materializations, no more dark seances, with their raps and bells and tambourines and banjos. At first the ghost would not hear of it. The voice in the corner declared that the Duncan Wraith had never thought of matrimony. But Eliphalet argued with them, and pleaded, and persuaded, and coaxed, and dwelt on the advantages of matrimony. He had to confess, of course, that he did not know how to get a clergyman to marry them, but the voice from the corner gravely told him that there need be no difficulty in regard to that, as there was no lack of spiritual chaplains. Then, for the first time, the house ghost spoke a low, clear, gentle voice, and with a quaint, old-fashioned New England accent, was contrasted sharply with the broad Scotch speech of the family ghost. She said that Eliphalet Duncan seemed to have forgotten that she was married, but this did not upset Eliphalet at all. He remembered the whole case clearly, and he told her she was not a married ghost, but a widow, since her husband had been hanged for murdering her. Then the Duncan ghost drew attention to the great disparity in their ages, saying that he was nearly four hundred and fifty years old, while she was barely two hundred. But Eliphalet had not talked to juries for nothing. He just buckled to, and coaxed those ghosts into matrimony. Afterwards he came to the conclusion that they were willing to be coaxed, but at the time he thought he had pretty hard work to convince them of the advantages of the plan. "'Did he succeed?' asked Baby Van Rensselaer, with a woman's interest in matrimony. "'He did,' said Uncle Larry. He talked the wraith of the Duncans and the specter of the little old house at Salem into a matrimonial engagement, and from the time they were engaged he had no more trouble with them. They were rival ghosts no longer. They were married by their spiritual chaplain the very same day that Eliphalet Duncan met Kitty Sutton in front of the railing of Grace Church. 
the ghostly bride and bridegroom went away at once on their bridal tour and the lord and lady duncan went down to the little old house at salem to pass their honeymoon uncle larry stopped his tiny cigar was out again the tale of the rival ghosts was told a solemn silence fell on the little party on the deck of the ocean steamer broken harshly by the hoarse roar of the foghorn End of chapter 9 Recording by René Lacroix Woodstock, Ontario, Canada